There are two great dedications in November. The Church of the Holy Savior, which is really another name for St. John Lateran. The great basilica, which is the Pope's church, not as Pope, that's St. Peter's on the Vatican, but as Bishop of Rome. One of its names is the Church of the Holy Savior, and its feast of dedication is November the 9th. And since we are talking about the dedications of basilicas, two other basilicas in Rome, and these churches, these great churches, belong to the whole Catholic world. Saints Peter and Paul is the 18th. Now, that's easy to remember. The 9th of November, and what's twice nine? Any mathematicians here? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Are both dedications of great churches in Rome. So three of the seven basilicas of Rome are commemorated in the month of November. Well, of course, the month of November, above all, begins with the Feast of All Saints. That was the date that Pius XII chose to proclaim the last great dogma connected with Our Lady to be defined from the chair. The Assumption was defined on the Feast of Our Lady, Queen of All Saints and All Martyrs. You would have expected him to define it on the Feast of the Assumption, August the 15th, as Pius IX defined the Immaculate Conception on December the 8th. But he didn't. He chose to define it on the Day of All Saints, for the, all the saints in heaven to rejoice at the new honor of their queen. So all saints on the first, all souls on the second, and that is the feast that gives the theme for the whole month, All Souls Day. Then on the fifth, all relics. So these three feasts go very well together, very hard to forget them once you see their connection. All Saints, the 1st of November, All Souls, the 2nd, All Relics. There's a feast for all the relics. If you have any relic, the Feast of the Relics is the 5th. So I think I have mentioned about one-third of the... So just for this simple review, connected with our Lord, we might say the Feast of the Holy Savior on the 9th. Connected with Our Lady, the first thing we think of is the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's when she was presented at the age of three in the temple, where she stayed for 11 years. The Blessed Virgin Mary was in the temple for 11 years, from the age of three to the age of 14. And the feast of her presentation by her father and mother, St. Joachim and St. Anna, is November the 21st. Then for apostles, we say St. Andrew the 30th, and it's not the prime feast of St. Peter and Paul, but the dedication of the major church in honor of each of them, St. Peter on the Vatican, which is the Pope's church as Pope, and St. Paul outside the wall. Those two churches are commemorated, the dedication of those great basilicas, commemorated on November 18. The doctors of the church, we have St. Albert on the 15th, St. John of the Cross on the 24th. Then connected with our work here, I could mention many, many things. St. Catherine of Alexandria, who was Sister Catherine's patroness, is the 25th. St. Leonard of Port Morris, the 26th. By the way, Brother Hugh's feast, his patron, is the 17th. November 17th is St. Hugh of Lincoln. We are going to have many more. You see how it's not easy to stay to one-third of the month, but certainly before we leave this month of November, we will know at least one-third of its days connected with a holy mystery. Now, this was one of the very first assignments Father gave us. And he said, we are going to connect every day of the year with something holy, something related to the faith. And at first we thought that's impossible, but it was amazing how quickly we found that you could name something connected with every day. It was a kind of a bargain, you see. A father equivalently said to every one of us, I am going to propose to you something for which you might want to give your whole life. You have only one life to live, and what could be more stupid if you have only one life to live 
than to use it for anything less than the best. And he said, I propose to you that when our Lord said the last message he gave to the world, go in therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. So what's the reason why people will be condemned, refusing to believe? They might do other things besides later. They will get punishments for those other things. But what is the common denominator of all those who, on the last day, will be condemned? That they did not believe. They refuse. They believe not. That's the reason. Now, in light of this assignment, which God gave to his whole church, and which is going to be the first and supreme issue on which everybody will be judged, he said, we have the duty to convert our country. Now, he equivalently said to everybody who ever met him, I challenge you to improve on that assignment. If you find something better than that, come and tell us, because we all intend to give our life to nothing less than the best. Well, nobody has come back to tell us what they found that was better, but many of them never came back. <laughs> <laughs> so we are still here with the help of God and as a sign of the blessing on us, the wonderful friends that we have. It's given me so much pleasure, so much joy, so much happiness to see that our crusade is still moving. The people who are destroying the church from the inside that's where we heard it from the highest authority when he spoke of the auto-demolition. He prophesied because he was the high priest. <laughs> the auto-demolition. The church is being destroyed from the inside. Now, as long as this life lasts, I guess there's very little we can do about it. But in the end, there is going to be an accounting, and it's going to be before the all-powerful, the almighty. And there, nobody will get away without giving account of their responsibility. Why should the church be destroyed, and why from the inside? I can see why we should be attacked from the outside, but why should the people whose duty it is to preserve the faith, to spread the faith, to edify the church, should be the very ones destroying it? Well, I don't know. There must be some deep mystery about it. But we feel that Our Lady has put her finger on us and gave us the very sweet burden of being the watchmen of the night. We have promised Our Lady, and with the help of God, we are going to keep that promise. The holy Catholic faith is going to be professed, believed in, lived, defended on this little area here with no compromise. We are not going to be intimidated. We are not going to be scared. We are not going to put any other interest above it. And if this year we know a little bit our faith, in another year we are going to know a little bit more. But with the help of God, we are continuing along that line, which was clearly indicated for us by signs from heaven. So, for today, I have given a sentence from the whole body of the liturgy of the Mass. That's not a sentence that is said once in a while. It's a sentence said every single week. So you must have heard it thousands and thousands of times. And it will be nice to know exactly what it says. When the priest turns around and says, Orate Fratris. Orate Fratris. Orate. Ora is how you commend one person. When you want to commend a group, you say, Orate. Ora. Pray. Orate. Pray, too. In English, we can distinguish. But pray, you are talking to a group then. Or orari, to pray. Orate fratris, pray, brethren. Now, when you say brethren, all the laws of all languages use the word brethren there to include sisters. You don't have it sororis. You don't have to add it. It's understood. Just as when we say all men are mortal, it doesn't mean that women are immortal. <laughs> it means if you possess human nature, you are mortal. 
So it's not by way of ignoring women, but by way of the normal use of the language. So that really means brethren and sisters, brothers and sisters, pray. And notice, Father, this, is what, this was one of Father's very favorite quotations. I don't know any subject he spoke about more often, because it proves that in the true sense of the word, without making us all priests and priestesses, <laughs> we do offer with the priest. And it's not his sacrifice, it is his sacrifice and ours. So when the priest turns around and says, Great brethren, utneum, that mine, ac vestrum, ac is a contraction from atque, and also, and also, vestrum, your sacrifice, acceptabile fiat, the ut of purpose is always followed by a verb in the subjunctive. So, pray, brethren, for what purpose? That my sacrifice and yours may become acceptable before God the Father Almighty. This could be a meditation. I could say almost a prayer, but it's more in the nature of a meditation, to realize that we do have, even those who are not priests, an intrinsic connection with the holy sacrifice. And that when the priest offers, and especially when we are with him, participating with our faith, with our prayers, it's a sacrifice that belongs just as much to us as to him. Only the priest can consecrate, and without a priest we cannot offer it. But once we are with him, it becomes his sacrifice and ours. That's the sense in which lex orandi est lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of believing. The church teaches by the way it prays. If throughout the centuries, millions and millions, Somebody could volunteer to compute how many millions of times a priest have turned around and said, Orate fratris, ut meum et vestrum sacrificium, acceptabile fiat apodeum patrem omnipotentem. If that was being done, that means the Church is teaching us that the sacrifice of the Mass is mm -hmm. our sacrifice as much as it is the priest's sacrifice. Now then I added a Roman proverb, so I just got the idea a few months ago to contrast the Latin that gives us the supernatural wisdom with the Latin which also a great natural value. I have heard people who are not Catholic defending the tremendous value of Latin and the learning of Latin. I have heard people speak very eloquently of how important it would be to keep Latin an important factor in all liberal education. That's because even naturally speaking, it's a tremendous depository of wisdom. So this is a Roman proverb, which says, res non verba. Res means thing, but it's the same word for the singular and the plural. You conjugate it, res, rei, rei, rem, re, then res. You go back to the plural nominative, it's res again, the same thing. And what it means is, we want Deeds, not words. I feel like giving that answer when I get long distance calls saying, what do you think of what's happening in Rome and all these statements coming and so on? I say, res non verba. Let's wait and see what actions. We have had many, many regimes in which the verba were one thing and the res were another. So we await actions. That's what will count in the end. Res non verba. A very important thinker and writer of this century was a German writer by the name of Hecker, H-A-E-C-K-E-R. And he wrote a book on Virgil. He was a great scholar. And he was greatly fascinated by the man that he thought was probably the greatest pagan who ever lived, the poet Virgil who lived, by the way, in the same century in which our Lord was born. Virgil died just a few years before our Lord was born. He wrote the greatest Latin poem that was ever written, the Aeneid. And this German scholar, who lived in this very century, one of the very exceptionally intelligent and discerning minds, wrote a book on Virgil calling him the father of the West. The Aeneid, you know, was written 
to commemorate a great victory of the West and what the West stands for, which could be put in general terms, the sovereignty of order, of reason, of law, in opposition to what Antony had identified himself with. It was the Battle of Axiom which decided the war between Octavius, who became the first emperor, Augustus Caesar, on the one side, who was fighting for the West, against what Antony had identified himself with, Cleopatra and Orientalism and Obscurantism. And Virgil considered that the decisive battle, one of the great decisive battles of all history, the Battle of Axiom in the year 31 BC, I don't know if it's one of the 24 dates I've asked you to remember, but if it isn't, you can reconnect it right away with right after the assassination of Julius Caesar. Because after the assassination of Julius Caesar, there was the second triumvirate, and that led to the first empire when one of the leaders of the triumvirate came out victor against the other one who had rebelled, he had gone to the east, identified himself with Cleopatra and Orientalism. And the two forces met very close to the spot where the Battle of Lepanto was won. Axiom and Lepanto are almost the same spot. Western Greece, mixture of water and land. And the Battle of Axiom, the year 31 BC. One day we are going to add to our list the 10 crucial battles of history. The Battle of Axiom will certainly be one of them. It decided the triumph of Augustus, who, as a result of that battle, became the first Roman emperor. And the great Roman poet, Latin poet, Virgil, wrote the Aeneid to glorify the ideals of the West in honor of that victory. So this intellectual of our time, intellectual in the very best sense of the word, who was a fighter at the same time of every form of totalitarianism, whether in its Nazi form or communist form, suffered a great deal and wrote some of the most interesting books that were written in our time. He noted that every language has one crucial word in which is summarized the genius of that language. And he said the Anglo-Saxon language, it's the word sense. They use that word in so many different meanings that you can't translate it into any other language. How could you translate to German or Russian or Arabic or any language what you mean when you say good sense, common sense, horse sense? How could you possibly get that into any other language? It doesn't make sense. What do you mean it doesn't make sense? You mean you can't feel it? No, it doesn't make sense. Nonsense. <laughs> In French, he said, it's the word raison. Raison d'être, raison d'état, de bon raison. I mean, all kinds of usage of the word raison. You can't translate it. It's just French. It's the central, the core value for the French mind at work. In Greek, the word logos, which, by the way, shows in every modern language, in the term in the end of our sciences, our different philosophic disciplines, when you speak of geology or philology, that logy at the end comes from logos. Trying to explain, to penetrate the great mystery of the Trinity, introduces the second person of the Trinity as the logos, the word. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. As a matter of fact, it's too bad that we translate that word. We should keep it Greek, because it really is untranslatable. Well, when he came to Latin, the word was res, R-E-S. It's the tribute to the great Latin genius of reality. They wanted reality. The Greeks were fascinated by the idea. The Latins, the Romans, were fascinated by the, the thing. Now, you translate it by the word thing, but it's a very weak translation. It's really, as it occurs in Latin, it's untranslatable. So when they say res non verba, 
It means don't give me words, give me accomplishments, give me deeds, give me realities. I'm not going to stop with the word. So that's a very, very Latin proverb, and it will become one of our proverbs from this day on. Now, I was hoping we will do the Dies Irae Dies Illa, Solvet Seclum in Favilla, Teste David Cum Sibilla. That's that beautiful sequence. That should be the theme for the month of November, all right? And first, learn how to translate it, and second, that's probably one of the most beautiful poems ever penned. Again, as I was saying, that I have known an awful lot of people who consider that the loss of the Latin language was a tragedy, a real tragedy, to all our values, to our education, to our spirit, who were not defending it because they had the faith, they didn't have the faith, but just because they were people who had good common sense, <laughs> good values, natural values. There is such a thing as natural goodness. In the same way, I have known many, many people who say that even considered as literature, this is one of the most beautiful poems, lyrics, ever written. Pompidou left in his will that he wanted the traditional mass of the dead to be said and the Dies Irae to be sung over his... And so they had to do it for him, because he couldn't ignore it. Now, I don't think he was especially a man of very great faith, but at least that was a value that he couldn't conceive himself buried unless that thing was accompanying him. I hope he saved his soul. So, dies ire, dies illa, solvet seclum in favilla. Dies ire, the day of wrath. Dies illa, that day, solvet seclum in favilla, is going to dissolve the world in ashes. Favilla is the word they used when they burned over the pyre, the bodies of the emperors or the pagan heroes. They referred to the ashes, the burning ashes, as the favilla. So this poet conceives the end of the world, which is going to be in, by fire, we are told. That's a part of the faith. The old world, the world of the patriarchs, was destroyed by water in the flood. And God promised that there will be no other destruction of the world except at the end of time, when the world will be remade for the state of glory that will be with us, and we will be in it forever. And that is going to be by fire. And that's what that hint is about. In that day, that means the last day, when all time is over and eternity is just begun, the world will be destroyed by fire, and it will look like like the pyre on which the body of the dead were burned. By the testimony, tested David, by the testimony of David and of the Sibyls. The Sibyls were prophecies that even among the pagans survived, making them expect the coming of the Savior. That was the principal purpose of those prophecies. Were they pure prophecies as are found in the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Baruch and Ezekiel and Daniel and Osi, the books of the Holy Scripture? No. Admixtures of superstition, of paganism got into them. But a core always remained there, promising the coming of the Savior. Remember, even the pagans, whether they were the Romans or the Greeks or the Indians or the Japanese, they were all descended from Noah. Their ancestors were in that one ark when the whole human race was reduced to eight people. Noah and his wife, his three sons, Sam, Cam, Japheth, and their three wives. The whole human race was there. Now that's of the faith. Any way of thinking that is going contrary to that is against the faith. What was the greatest thought in the mind of those eight people? the promise of a savior to come. That's what they bequeathed to all their descendants. And no matter how many false religions arose, no matter how many myths, legends, false gods, false ways of worship, there was always, in every form of paganism, one core of the expectation of the Savior to come. It was always there. And people of goodwill in any nation could always discover that and make it the lead thought in their mind and keep waiting and praying for the coming of the Savior.
You say, is there in literature, in writing, any indication that it was so? Yes, the Sibyls. We have the documents as far as the Romans were concerned. And some of the statements said there are just as clear, at least as far as telling that a Savior will come, as anything you find in Isaiah's. Just saying that a Savior will come and save the whole human race. So the poet there is referring to the fact that not only in the Old Testament, summarized there by David, who wrote the Psalms, but even by the Sibyls of Rome. Quantus tremor est futurus? What terror is going to come? Remember, futurus is the future participle from the verb to be. Sum, esse, fui, futurus. That's the way we give the four parts of the verb to be. Sum, I am, esse, to be, fui, I was, futurus, I am about to be. And this is the root from which we get the word future. The future. What's the future? The what is about to be. What's coming. Hmm? Quantus tremor est futurus. What terror is about to be? Quando judex est venturus. When the judge is about to come. Cuncta stricte discusurus. All things strictly to take account of. So we are going to face a judgment. Every one of us will face that judgment the moment we die. That is called the particular judgment. But there is a universal judgment of the whole race when we will all gather around the throng of Jesus Christ, when the saints will stand beside him judging. Don't forget that. If you become a saint, you will be standing beside Jesus judging. You will be telling Jesus how many people helped you when you were trying to fulfill the very simple assignment that he gave us. He didn't give us too many assignments. We make it complicated. He kept it extremely simple. If you really make salvation the most important thing in your own life, if you really try to help everybody, the closer to you they are, the more you are responsible for them. Are we somehow responsible for all men in some sense? But our Lord gave us the aspect under which we ought to love. He didn't say men, he said neighbor. So the more they have that aspect of being neighbor, the more we are really connected and concerned about them. We have more duty to be concerned about the good of our fellow countrymen than we do about the people who live in the Tibet. We might pray for the Tibet, but there is very little neighborly connection with them. God has the responsibility proportioned to the situation in which we are placed. We should pray for each other and love each other much more than we love anybody who is not as close to us as we are to each other. That's true loyalty. We should love our country more than we love every other country. Quantus tremor est futurus. So we all are going to stand on the day of judgment and give account of every grace we received and what we did with it. Tuba mirum spargens sonum, a wonderful trumpet. That's tuba means trumpet, mirum. Mirum spargens sonum. Spargens spreading. Mirum sonum, a wonderful sound. So a trumpet spreading a wonderful sound. Per sepulcra regionem, regionum, through the sepulchres of all the different regions, Corget omnes ante tronum, forcing everybody to appear before the throne. The Arab poet Abu Ala al Ma'ari, 1000 years ago, said, Look, everywhere I look, I see graves. And yet, where are all the graves from the days of Adam? Be careful how you walk. You are stepping on the bodies of those who lived before you. That's a beautiful poet, and it's much more beautiful when you give it in the language of poetry in which it was said. So, graves, everywhere you go, graves. Now, we should be grave-minded this month, because every time you visit a grave and pray for the souls in purgatory, you obtain indulgence. That's the month dedicated specially for this devotion. So, through the sepulchres, you say, where are the sepulchres? Just a few places here and there. The world is all one large sepulchre, if you think of it all the graves that have been destroyed ever since, the bodies of those who lived who were buried there are still in the dust of the earth. 
more stupebit et natura, death shall be astounded, and so is nature. Cum resurget creatura, when the creatures shall come back to life. Judicanti responsura, to answer to the one judging him. You say, no, they won't be surprised when this happens because they knew all the time. Didn't they say every time in their creed? The resurrection of the dead, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. Well, the apostles, the twelve apostles, heard our Lord tell them many, many, many times that he was going to rise from the dead. And yet, when they found that he did rise from the dead, they were flabbergasted. So, no matter how many times we heard it, when we see it realized, just imagine if, if right at this moment, right out of this floor, the bodies of the saints, as a matter of fact, the bodies of everybody, whether saints or no saints, come back to life. Do you say, well, we knew it all the time, or would we be a little bit excited? <laughs> Liber scriptus proferetur in quo totum continetur unde mundus judicetur. A written book shall be offered in which everything is contained by which the world will be judged. Judex ergo cum sedebi. Talking about in meditation, I don't know in the world any literature for meditation to compare with this beautiful poem. Every single verse of it you think would want to stop with it and stay for an hour just thinking. Judex ergo cum sedebit, therefore when the judge shall sit, quid quid latet apparebit, everything that was hidden will come out, will be clear, will come out to the surface. Nil in ultum remanebit, and nothing will remain unavenged. One of the commentators, when God said, vengeance is mine, vengeance is mine, therefore vengeance is something good. God didn't say it's a bad thing, but he said, keep it to me, it's so good that I won't let anybody have it. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing when we find that every injustice that was ever committed is going to be avenged. If that is not true, there is no God. Nil in ultum remanebit. Nothing will remain unavenged. However, keep the vengeance to God. Don't take it into your own hands. Quid sum miser trunc dicturus? What am I going to say then, who am so miserable? Quem patronum rogaturus? What patron am I going to call upon? Cum vix justus sit securus, when even the just is hardly safe. The just in Holy Scripture always means holy. Justice in Holy Scripture always means holiness. There is another kind of justice, the kind of justice where you can prove that you didn't deserve a parking ticket or anything like that. That belongs to the natural order. But the justice that Holy Scripture is interested in is the supernatural justice, and its other name is holiness. Rex tremende maestatis, the king of great majesty, qui salvandus salvas gratis, who shall salve freely, gratis, we even use it in English, all those who will be saved. Salva me fons pietatis, save me, O fountain of mercy, of kindness, of gentleness. Recordare Jesu pie, remember, O Jesus, merciful. Quod sum causa tue vie, I am the cause of your coming to via, as used in the language of theology and of spiritual writing, via means this life, this mortal life. That's why a man who is still in this mortal life is called a viator, still on the way. The end of that way, when we have gone through this way, what do you say? If we make it, we are in patria, and what do they call a person who has made patria? Comprehensor. So viator is in this way, in mortal life, comprehensor already in possession. Only one man was at the same time viator and comprehensor, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. Because from the moment of his conception, even to his agony on the cross, he never lost. That's the human mind of Jesus. Of course, his divine mind was always divine. The beatific vision is not God knowing God, it is a creature knowing God. Jesus, in his human knowledge, in his human mind, had the beatific vision and never lost it, not even in the agony of the cross. So he was, at the same time, now this is theology, just to know that one sentence, is to know a tremendous truth of theology. Jesus our Lord, from the very moment of his conception in the virginal womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, 
was a viator, that means had a mortal nature, and at the same time a comprehensor had the beatific vision. No other human being could that be said of. So I am the cause of you are coming to this way. God did not have to come and be immortal, expose himself to insults and to pain and suffering and even finally death, disappointments. Neme perdas ila die. Please don't lose me on that day. Now you say he doesn't care. He does care. If you want to know the agony of the garden, it is when he was thinking of all the people who would not let him save them. That's the agony of the garden. Some of the saints, St. Alphonsus Maria has meditated on that mystery. He is the one who saw clearly why our Lord said, pro multis, not for all men. He wanted it to be for all men. He paid the price for the salvation of all men, but all men wouldn't let him save them. So he was encouraging himself by saying, still there will be many that will be saved, many. The absolute number is still many. There will probably be millions saved. But relatively speaking, all the indications don't show that the majority are saving their souls. We don't judge any individual. We don't know how anybody ends up his life. All we know is the direction in which they are moving. It doesn't look good for many people. So please, dear Jesus, don't let me be one of those that will be your loss in that day. Parents <coughs> may say this tilasso, seeking me, you sat tired. Do we know from Holy Scripture that Jesus could get tired? It's told in the story at the Samaritan well, when he talked to the woman of Samaria. That lets us know that our Lord took all that goes with our human life as long as it did not indicate guilt, as long as it did not indicate any contraction, any co contact with sin. To be tired is not sinful, therefore our Lord had it just as to die is not sinful, and our Lord was capable of dying. So you sat very tired. Redemisti crucem passus, you redeemed us, suffering the pain of the cross. Tantus labor, non sit casus. Let not such labor be wasted. That's what non sit casus. Let it not be vain casus. Lacrimosa dies ille. That lacrimosa, what does it mean? Tearful, that tearful day, qua resurgit ex favilla, in which shall rise from the ashes Eudicandus to be judged, homo Deus, the guilty man, huic ergo parce Deus, to that guilty man in which I see myself, please have mercy, spare, O Lord. Pie Jesu Domine, Lord Jesus, merciful. Dona eis requiem, give them rest. So before the end of this month, we are going to know this hymn. All right, that's the bargain.